Good morning and welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas Breaking Ground. This talk is mainframe hacking for kicks and giggles and is given by Jay and John. A few announcements before we begin. We'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, SEMGREP, Toyota, Conductor One. It's their support along with our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. These talks are being streamed live, and as a courtesy to our speakers and audience, we ask that you check to make sure that your cell phones are set to silent. If you have a question, use the audience microphone so YouTube can hear you. The microphone is right up here, up front. As a reminder, the B-Sides Las Vegas photo policy prohibits taking pictures without the explicit, express, explicit I'm sorry, uh, permission of everyone in the frame. These talks are all being recorded and will be available on YouTube in the future. All right, with that, let's, let's get started. Morning. Oh, big help. Uh, so thank you for being here this morning, especially on a topic as esoteric as mainframes. Uh, specifically mainframe applications. Um, <clears throat> so a show of hands, how many people here have used a mainframe as a developer, a sysprog, or a user? Okay, good amount. How many of those in the last five years? Even less. And then how many people have done a security assessment on a mainframe? Okay, a few. There should be way more people than that. Um, and it turns out that it's really, really hard to do this stuff for reasons that we're gonna get into. So a bit of housekeeping. Uh, the first thing is that we have a lot to talk about and we only have a short amount of time to do it. So by necessity, we're gonna have to move fast and it's gonna feel like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, as I said, this is on YouTube, so you can always go back and look at it later. The second thing is that we are not mainframe experts. Uh, we're security researchers who were asked to look at mainframe applications and we kinda had to figure this stuff out from the ground up. So if you're a mainframe expert, whether that's a developer or a sysprog or whatever, you know, we apologize in advance for anything we say wrong. We're security researchers, not mainframe gurus. And then the final thing is a disclaimer. Um, we are not here on behalf of or representing our employer and anything that we say is our own views and not those of our employer. So with all of that out of the way, uh, this is the research team. My name is Jay Smith. I've been doing IT for about 25 years. I've done everything from Thank you for calling the help desk, uh, systems and network engineering, SOC work, not work, development, and now I'm a lead security researcher at my company. My name is John. I got my career started in software development. Then I moved into uh, information security compliance. And eventually I got into application security. I've worked mostly with HTTP based applications, um, some native mobile apps, and most recently mainframes, which we're excited to talk to you all about today. And then the third member of our research team is Garland. Uh, he could not be here even though he should be. Uh, his contributions were extremely valuable and we wanna make sure that everyone knows he was a part of this, this project. <clears throat> so uh, when you talk about any other topic in security, there's a basic amount of information that you can assume people have. They know how web applications work, they know how Windows works, Linux works, and so on. We don't really have that foundation with mainframes, so to really talk about this, we have to talk about what mainframes are and how they work. So when I talk to people about this kind of research and I say, hey, I do a lot of stuff with mainframes, this is what they think of. Um, they think it's this legacy, archaic system, you know, was built back in the 70s or 80s and is shoved in a back room of a closet somewhere. All the time I get, oh, I worked with those things back in the 80s, they're still around. Um, or they think it's this giant monolithic machine that takes up an entire room and requires a team of people to operate, like Joshua from War Games. Well, the reality is today they look like this. Uh, this is a Z16 mainframe, top of the line, uh, costs high six, low seven figures, and it's one of the most powerful commercial computers you can buy. Uh, it runs an architecture known as the Z architecture and an operating system known as ZOS. And just to give you an example of how powerful they can be, one of these can run over 200 server grade CPUs, 40 terabytes of RAM, and petabytes and petabytes of storage. So these are, there's nothing archaic or legacy about them. They are extremely powerful in modern machines. And whether you realize it or not, you rely on them all the time. Probably every single person in here has relied on it one just to get here. Uh, if you've ever used a credit card, withdrawn money from an ATM, booked a plane, uh, scanned a check for a mobile deposit, anything like that, you have relied at some point on a mainframe during that interaction. 
Uh, they have been and continue to be the backbone of many modern industries uh, and diverse industries such as finance and banking, healthcare, utilities, government, insurance. All of these industries rely on mainframes to do their day-to-day -day operations. And you might be asking why. I mean, these things were in the 50s and 60s. Why are people still using them? And there's a lot of reasons. But just to give a couple of examples, these machines can have mean time between failures measured in decades. Uh, you can take an application that was developed in the 70s and drop it on a brand new Z16 mainframe that you just got, and it's going to work right out of the box. Uh, that's like taking a DOS application and running it on Windows 11 with no emulation or compatibility. It just runs. Um, and for our purposes, they are very, very good at high-speed transaction processing, and this is one of the primary reasons they're used. Uh, to give some context, a modern mainframe can process up to 100 billion transactions per day. So that's the equivalent of hundreds of Cyber Mondays per day per machine. So these are incredibly powerful machines. Given the power of them and given the criticality of them, they are also incredibly high-risk systems. So if Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or something like that were to go offline today, people would whine about it, they'd moan about it, but something else would pop, their place in life, pop up in their place and life would go on. If mainframes were to stop working today, it would be global economic pandemonium, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, finance would grind to a halt, so you can't get money, you can't spend money. Uh, food shelves, uh, grocery stores would be empty because the logistics would stop working, planes, trains, all of it would stop. They are that critical to our uh, infrastructure. Um, unfortunately, for reasons that we will get into, they are not tested as frequently enough or as thoroughly enough as they need to be. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to John who's going to talk about the application side. So the first thing we'll cover is how mainframe applications differ from traditional distributed systems. Let's say you have a web application. Whether it's in the cloud or on-premise, you'll likely have an application server, a database server, an authentication server, a logging server, and all these distinct systems that support the same application. On the mainframe, everything is self-contained. There are no distributed components. So if you need a database, well, mainframes have subsystems rather than do pretty much anything you need for an application. So if you need a database, there's a subsystem for DB2. If you need access control, there's a subsystem for RACF. If you need a facility for maintenance and development, there's a subsystem for TSO and so on. So now, mainframe applications generally fall into one of two categories depending on the type of processing they perform. The first kind is batch processing. So with these applications, you'll typically submit a task, work related to that task is completed, and eventually you get some kind of result. So for example, a utility company with a mainframe will likely have a monthly batch process that calculates consumption data and generates billing statements for all of their customers. So the time that these take to run is proportionate to the task that's being performed. So we can have batch processes, processes running for minutes, hours, or even days. And because of this, end users aren't typically interfacing with batch applications directly. Instead, these are scheduled or just kicked off by some back-end process, and they just run until they're done. In contrast, we have mainframe applications that perform online transaction processing, or OLTP. And these are more like the types of applications that we're all familiar with, right? So this is when a end user submits a task and they'll get an immediate response, or submits a request and gets an immediate response. So you're at, any, you're at an ATM, you tap to view your account balance, and you're immediately presented with your account balance. We're not waiting around for a batch process to finish because these applications are running online. So the most common OLTP system on the mainframe is Kix, or the Customer Information Control System. And Kix is just another subsystem that supports the running of mainframe applications online. And these are more like the types of applications we're all familiar with. Right? Um, so you're at an ATM, you tap to view your account balance, you're immediately presented with your account balance. Um, so we can think of Kix as a proto web server before the web. And this is a rough analogy, but it'll help us understand some of the terminology. So when you're working with a Kix application, the terminal can be thought of as your web browser. And Kix does have other front ends, but if you're interacting with Kix directly on the mainframe, you're going to be using a terminal emulator. So once you're in the terminal emulator, you need to know where to go. On a web application, you'll typically just enter a URL in your web browser. In a Kix application, this is your region. So you need to know what region you're logging into. 
So in this example, DVCA prod is a region that we're logging into from our terminal. So once you're logged into your region, you need to know what page on that website you want to get to. So in Kix, this is a transaction. It's a four character alphanumeric transaction ID. So once you're logged into the region, you enter the transaction ID for the screen that you want to access. And you can access any transaction on that region provided you're authorized to do so. So as I mentioned earlier, there are multiple ways to interface with Kix. Most of these are facilitated by APIs that expose Kix to systems outside of the mainframe. So you can have web applications, web services, RPC clients, desktop applications, native mobile applications, and all these various interfaces that interact with Kix as a backend system. Now you may not realize it, but many of the applications we all use today utilize Kix as a backend processing system. So Kix is still one of IBM's flagship mainframe products. In fact, the latest version of Kix was released just last year. However, Kix suffers from this concept of a legacy code base running on modern infrastructure. So as Jay mentioned earlier, you can take a Kix application that was developed 50 years ago, drop it on a modern mainframe, and it's just going to run. This is great for maintenance and compatibility, but it's terrible for security. Because many of these applications were developed at a time when security just wasn't a priority. In fact, it's not uncommon for Kix applications to go 10 plus years without a single code release. And part of this problem is that the original developers retired 10 plus years ago, and the ones left maintaining it have no idea how anything works. So this is a problem that reinforces the need for ongoing security testing of these applications. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done, and Jay's going to tell us why. <clears throat> all right, so the reason that we're all here testing this stuff. Uh, so management came to us and said, we need people to test mainframe applications. And we're like, cool, that sounds awesome. Let's do that. How do we do that? And they were like, we don't know. Figure it out. Uh, so we tried to figure it out. And this was us for the first year. Um, to say that mainframes are difficult to work with is a drastic understatement. Um, there's really no parallels that you can draw to other kind of work, whether it's systems engineering, network engineering, development, whatever. All of that goes out the window when working with mainframes. You have to learn a completely new language, completely new world, everything. So that's what we started to do, but we ran into a number of problems. So the first one, and the biggest one, is gatekeeping. Um, to say that mainframe developers and sysprogs are prickly is an understatement. Um, Whenever we try to talk to them, if you don't know the terminology, if you don't know how to say what they want you to say or the way they want you to say it, they'll flat out tell you to get out of their face. They don't want you near their systems. They don't want you touching their stuff. They don't want anything to do with you. And to be fair to them, they have some reasons to do that because if you don't know what you're doing, it's pretty easy to bring down an entire LPAR. Ask me how I know that. Um, when you get that, that phone call from a pissed off mainframe dev, like they're angry. Um, so they, they do have some legitimate reasons for not wanting people on their system. But when you try to research this stuff, if you think Reddit is like a cesspool, read mainframe forums. So trying to look at stuff, so I, I just spent literally two minutes on one of the popular mainframe forums just looking for examples of developers being assholes. Um, so here we have one where they said, if it's uh, so urgent, why don't you read the manual? Well, if it's urgent, you don't have time to read the manual, plus the manuals are almost impossible to read. Uh, this dude, and he has a lot of these posts, he won't even touch your post if you don't make it colorful and pretty for him. And then this is my favorite. Um, I doubt it's throwing errors because errors are not thrown on the mainframe. So this is what you will come across all the time when working with mainframe developers. So that was the, the first hurdle that we ran into. Uh, the second one is cost. Now thankfully we had the backing of our company and we had access to true big iron mainframes so we could do this stuff. But if you're just an enthusiast or working with a smaller company and you want to emulate a ZOS system, you're looking at about $6,000 per person per year just to have an emulated ZOS. And that's well outside the range of an average researcher. Uh, there, are, there is an open source solution which we will get into later. If you want to do any other kind of uh, testing out there, web applications, thick clients, Active Directory, whatever, there is a wealth of tools out there. There's tools for every single thing that you would want to do, and it's easy to build your own tools because there's already so many tools out there. Well, with mainframes, almost none of that exists. From an application perspective, we found three tools that could kind of do what we wanted. Two of them hadn't been updated in five to eight years, and one of them only kind of did surface stuff. Uh, so in the end, we had to build our own tool. And then finally, 
the gatekeeping combined with the difficulty of mainframes makes it an extremely steep learning curve. So whatever it is that you want to learn, there's a training body out there and probably a certification. But none of the training bodies out there, SANS, OFSEC, TCM security, like nobody offers anything in the way of mainframe offensive security work. Um, I ended up, so these are some of mine personal library and I learned more digging through these books than I did on anything online on any course that I found. Um, so it, it's a difficult thing to get into. So at this point we were tasked with looking at these applications and we realized we had no idea what we were doing. So we just kind of had to start digging and researching. And I'm going to hand it over to John to talk about the research. Right, so once we figured out those challenges, we came across another problem. We had no idea how to get started and little reference material. So we continued our research and eventually came across the 3270 data stream programmers reference. And this was the official reference manual for developing 3270 based applications, which means it had everything we needed to build an attack model and start developing test cases. So this is what we learned. The 3270 terminal is a block mode terminal, which means anything you change on the screen is only sent back to the mainframe if you press one of about 35 attention identifier keys. And these were all physical keys on the 3270 on the terminal keyboard, which we don't see on keyboards today. And this will be relevant once we get to the demo. The screen buffer stores the data that represents the content you see on the screen. So it stores all the field values and information on how the fields, on the, how those fields should behave in the, in the uh, terminal. Notice how you can, this might be, uh, might be hard to see, but notice you can click anywhere on the screen and it doesn't matter if there's data, if it's a field or if it's just some random empty spot. This is because each character position in the screen corresponds to a location on the screen buffer. So when you're performing a security assessment on pretty much any application, an important consideration becomes how that application communicates with upstream and downstream systems. Traffic between the mainframe and the terminal emulator occurs over the TN3270 protocol. And this was IBM's way of adapting to the prevalence of TCP IP and personal computers in the early 80s because before that, mainframes were accessed using a dedicated terminal that was physically connected to the mainframe over coax cable. So IBM's solution was to wrap their existing 3270 data stream in Telnet and call it TN3270. Um, so this allowed mainframes to be accessed over TCP IP using a terminal emulator on pretty much any device that supports it. So you can analyze this traffic in Wireshark just like you would any other protocol. In fact, Wireshark has a dissector for TN3270 and you can even begin to uncover sensitive information in hidden fields this way. But in order to make some of the more interesting test cases possible, we needed a deeper understanding of the protocol. Fortunately, everything we needed was in chapter four of the reference manual. So there were two characteristics that made the majority of our test cases possible, start field orders and field attributes. An order is just a byte in the 3270 data stream that tells the terminal how to render the screen. So this is a field, this is where I want you to position that field on the screen. Each order corresponds to a specific byte value. So in this example, the first byte is equal to the, byte, the hex value 11. So we know it's a set buffer address order, which sets a field's location in the screen buffer. The next two bytes are just parameters for column and row that indicate the exact position on the screen. But the byte we're interested in is the start field order, because not only does this indicate the start of a field, it also indicates the start of a field attribute, which is the byte right next to it. So in order to illustrate why these bytes are important, I'll continue the web analogy. So whereas a web browser renders HTML that's transferred over HTTP, a terminal emulator renders a 3270 data stream that's transferred over TN3270. And we like to think of the start field order as an HTML input tag and the field attribute byte as HTML attributes for hiding and disabling an input tag. So let's focus in on the field attribute byte. Each highlighted bit in this byte has something to say about how that field is displayed on the screen. So the bit in position two determines whether a field is protected or unprotected. The bit in position three determines whether a field is numeric or alphanumeric. And the bits in positions four and five work together to determine whether a field is hidden or displayed. So we were especially interested in bits two, four, and five because if we could intercept this traffic and flip these bits so that protected fields become unprotected and hidden fields become visible, we would have viable test cases for hacking mainframe applications. And 
we got to share this research with you today because it worked. Uh, before we get into the demo, just a quick word on encryption. Our tool sort of works like Burp Suite. So we're, in we're sitting in between the mainframe and the, the emulator. We're just traf uh, we're proxying traffic between the mainframe and the emulator. So we negotiate TLS with the mainframe, but because the emulator emulators listening are connecting via loopback, we don't actually negotiate TLS with the emulator, and it doesn't enforce the need for encrypted traffic. Um, this is why we can intercept this traffic or analyze this traffic through Wireshark because it's plain text. Um, the connection between our tool and the, and the emulator. So yes, while TN3270 does support encryption, it doesn't actually prevent any of our test cases. All right, so we're just about ready for the demo. Um, before we do, uh, we'll show disabling field protections, we'll show uh, revealing, revealing sensitive information in hidden fields, and then we have some bonus attacks we'll iterate through all known transaction IDs, and then we'll brute force some application level secrets. So a little word about the demo. As we mentioned, if you wanted an emulated version of ZOS for your personal use, you're going to pay about $6,000 a year. Uh, I did mention that there was an open source solution, and that solution is MVS 3.8. Uh, due to historical legal reasons, it is a perfectly legal open source version of an older mainframe OS that you are able to run on your machine, and it's used with an emulator known as Hercules. There's a few ways to get it. The two primary ones, and I have the links there, the first one is TK4. And what this is, this is essentially a zip file that you just download, un uh, unpack, and run a shell script, and you have a mainframe up and running. Uh, the other one is a Docker container from MVS Community Edition, and this is the one I do recommend using because with it being the Community Edition, there have been numerous quality of life changes added to, three point, to MVS 3.8 to make it much easier to use. There's tools that have been added, libraries that have been added, uh, programs that have been added, so it's just a much easier to use version of MBS. And again, it's wrapped in a Docker container, so just Docker pull and you're good to go. Now, that gives you your, your mainframe. That's like, okay, now I can log, I can play with it, I can learn with it, but you can't do anything that we're gonna demo with just this. So we reached out to Soldier of Fortran and we said, hey, we need a vulnerable Kix application, but we don't have the knowledge to do this ourselves. Uh, can you help us out? And he's like, yeah, I got you, man. And he created DVCA, which is Damn Vulnerable Kix Application. This is along the same lines as web application, thick application. It's just an intentionally vulnerable application for you to play with. Uh, it comes also in a Docker container, and that Docker container is the MVS CE with this application bundled in it. So you just pull this, start it, and you have a vulnerable application uh, ready to go. But then you need to use something against that vulnerable application. And today we're releasing the tool that we've been working on for the past year, uh, Hack3270. So this is essentially burp for 3270 traffic. It allows you to intercept all the traffic and manipulate it in any number of ways. So you can read the hidden fields, you can disable protected fields, you can change each individual attribute. Uh, it has full logging capabilities, including a CSV export. So if you're on a penetration test and you need those artifacts for, for the test, you have all of that available for the client. Um, it also has brute force capabilities, so you can iterate through aid keys, you can iterate through um, passwords, uh, kicks transactions, whatever. So it's, we think, a fully featured tool that is available at the URL down below. You can go download it today and, and start playing with it. Uh, so we're going to try and do a live demo. Um, 3270 is notoriously finicky, uh, especially over a Docker container, and live demos you know, are always subject to the demo gods, which in fact they've already hit us because we can't do mirrored, so we're going to have to look at this while we do our demo. Uh, so wish us luck. So I'm going to start the Docker container. So with our tool, oh, I think it's good. Uh, so uh, with our tool, so we start it and we give it the server and port that we're connecting to and then the listening port. So in this case, we're connecting to the Docker container on port 3270, and we're listening for connections on 3271. I'm going to bring this down a bit. All right. So. All right, so now this is the equivalent of burp. Uh, when you have intercept turned on, it's waiting for you to send something through it and uh, allow the traffic to go through. So 
Now I'm going to connect to that and oh, I should change the screen. All right, so it, it has detected the connection. It says, okay, hey, I, I see a connection on uh, 3271. Let's, let's go ahead and do this. So I click continue and you can see that we are now on the Docker container. And again, I apologize that we can't mirror this, but that should be the last time I have to move anything over. All right. Um, don't do this. There we go. Okay. So the tool is running. We're proxying all traffic through the tool. I'm going to log on. And this is our vulnerable application. And John's going to go ahead and uh, walk through the next part. All right. This is going to be a challenge, but we'll get through it. All right, so DVCA is a generic application for ordering office supplies. Um, this is the main menu. We have three menu options. The first option allows us to order those office supplies. Okay. So here we have uh, printer paper, we have a three-hole paper puncher, we have some rosé, we have a 24-karat gold MacBook Pro. All right, so I'll go back to the main menu. And menu option two allows us to edit the shipping address that those items get sent to, right? But notice that in order for us to edit this shipping address, we have a supervisor code that we need to get past. All right, so we'll get back to the main menu. Menu option three is just a, an order history. So I'll go in and notice that we haven't ordered anything yet, yet, right? So let's order something. But before we do that, we have to get past that supervisor code. So I'll go back to the shipping address menu, which is menu option two. And I'll start to make some updates here. I won't actually go through all this. It's really hard to see from here. Um, but let's just make a couple of updates here. All right, so instead of sending that to Jay, we'll send it to me. We'll just update this to the hotel. OK, let's change this to. Okay. All right, I'll just change this to the last. Let's leave that. That'll be the last update I make here. All right, so we have made some updates to our shipping address. But if I try to enter this and persist this transaction, we'll get an error, right? So it says invalid supervisor code, which appears to be a four digit code. So in, if you were using Burp, you would probably use something like Intruder, right, in Burp. In our tool, we have, um, inject, in, we have inject into fields tab. <laughs> All right. It's on the other side. All right. Okay. So we have this inject into fields tab. So the first thing we would do is we would select our payload list. So in this case, we would ha uh, typically have a list of 10,000 payloads, right, or um, injections, um, one for each permutation of a four-digit supervisor code. Um, we have an abridged uh, payload list for the purpose of the demo. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and select that. So the next thing you would do is select the injection field, right? So we would click Setup. Um, we would select a mask character. Um, you can customize this. We'll leave it at, at an asterisk for now. So I'll go back into the app, and I'll change the supervisor code to our mask character. So we'll do four asterisks here. So our tool is asking us to submit a sample transaction using the mask character, right? So I'll go ahead and do that. And notice now the tool um, was able to identify the injection field. And it indicates that it's now ready for injection. 
So I'll go ahead and press inject. And notice you can see here all the permutations that it's iterating through. Um, so eventually it'll hit the correct supervisor code. I can't, I can't quite you can't see. see. Does it say? Does it say? It, it works? All right, cool. Okay, cool. All right, so we were able to brute force that supervisor code and make updates that were not authorized to do so. So that's our first test case. We'll go back to the main menu. Now that we've updated our shipping address, we can go in and order some office supplies. So I'll get, go back into menu option one. And let's order that 24 karat gold MacBook Pro. So it's $20,000, right? It's a little uh, bit past our budget. So it'd be nice if we could edit that field, right? Like in, in a web app, you'd probably use uh, developer tools or just proxy through Burp and, and make those updates and hopefully get some authorization bypass. Within our tool, we can use the hack fields tab. Yeah. All right, so I'll just drag that back over again. Was it on? All right, there it is. Okay. So the hack field tabs, we have a couple of options here. The start field, start field extended, and modified field, we're effectively telling the tool which start field order to parse. Currently we have all of them selected by default. And then on the left side we have disable field protection, um, enable hidden fields, and remove numeric only restrictions. So here that, that's where we're flipping those bits um, in the field attribute byte. And we have some other options here for um, the field intensity to highlight those fields that we're modifying. So we can toggle this now, I'll enable hack fields. And I'll go back to my tool and I'll try to make some updates here. Right, so I'll change this field, which is a protected field, and I'll update it from 20 grand to something a bit more reasonable, right, like a dollar. So because we've enabled hack fields, we've disabled field protections. So now if we hit enter, Okay, right, so I have to go down, indicate that yes, we want to purchase, and then hit earner, and now we've, we've, we were able to purchase that MacBook Pro. Yeah. Okay, let's update this again. Okay. Okay, so now hopefully we were able to purchase that MacBook Pro for a dollar, not 20 grand. So I'll disable hack fields now. And I'll go to the next item. Let's see what we have. So we have an ancient golden idol. Right, so if I try to purchase this, I would get an error indicating that it's denied, right? Where we can't purchase this golden idol. So I'll enable hack fields again. And notice we have this hidden field, right? So if I toggle it, toggle it off, we don't see that field. I toggle it on, we do see that field. And it's a field that seems to indicate whether or not we can purchase this item. So I'll change this from yes or from no to yes. I'll purchase the item. And now we're able to purchase an item that we were previously not authorized to do so. So I'm gonna disable hack fields and go back to the main menu. Okay, and we'll go into the order history to see some of the work we've just done. All right, so it looks like we purchased the MacBook Pro. We were able to purchase it for a dollar. Um, and then we were able to purchase the ancient Golden Idol despite it being um, not purchasable. So wouldn't it be nice if we could cover our tracks and delete this order history? All right, so we'll go back to the main menu. Sorry, again, it's hard to see. Yeah, we can't. There we go. All right. Okay. So we're back at the main menu. We'll enable hack fields. And notice now that there's a hidden menu option for deleting our order history. So we'll go in, we'll select that menu option. Okay, we'll hit enter. 
And now we've deleted all of our records from our order history. So let's go back in and confirm that that's the case. Okay, menu option three. And there you have it. We were able to cover our tracks. We deleted all of the order history. Okay, so up until now, we've demoed disabling field protections, enabling hidden fields, and brute forcing known um, application level secrets. All right, so the next test case will be using the, okay, we'll be using the inject key presses tab. Let me see if I could bring this back over again. Okay, so if we recall from earlier, I mentioned that there are about 35 attention identifier keys that send data to the mainframe, right? So we have the enter key, um, the clear uh, key, 24 function keys, and I think three uh, program access keys. So what we're doing here is we're iterating through all of these known attention, attention identifier keys in hopes of finding hidden functionality. Um, so because these applications were potentially developed decades ago, and because keyboards today don't necessarily have these physical keys, um, it's not a stretch of the imagination to think that mainframe developers and operators could have hidden functionality behind some of these keys, um, not necessarily out of malicious intent, but just to facilitate systems maintenance. So I'll go ahead and press the send keys button. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll let that run. We'll run it on this screen. Okay, and we'll go back to the main screen. We'll run that again. Notice some of these options are not selected. That's because if uh, for some applications, if you iterate through the clear button, for instance, it'll just log you out of, the, out of that um, application. So we've unselected some of these, but of course you can um, toggle those as needed. So notice we found this hidden screen within the application, within DVCA, by iterating, iterating through all known um, eight keys. So we could use the logs tab. We do have some uh, logging capabilities. <laughs> this will be maybe the last time we have to do this. Okay, so we do have some logging capabilities here. We have a column for, just, uh, for that ID, that traffic ID. We have the timestamp. Um, we have an indicator on whether that traffic was set from the server or the client. We have a length that you can use to check for discrepancies in the response from the server. Um, and then we have some notes regarding that, that traffic. So I'll sort by ID here. You can sort by these columns. Um, and notice that we have the traffic that we sent while we were iterating through all known transaction IDs. So you can actually click through um, some of these entries here. And if you, clip on, if you click on the server response, it'll actually update the screen on the terminal emulator. So you can see what was sent uh, during that specific um, entry. Um, so in this case, you would click through, you can see what was going on during that attack. So here it was sending um, the uh, program access key one, program access key two, three, and then you can click on these and you know see which one led to uh, a successful attack. See which one led to discovering hidden functionality in the application. Um, you can also just check the length, right, and, and check for discrepancies in the length, and that can be an indicator of some hidden functionality there. Um, you can also you can also scroll down. Um, you can see whenever you toggle um, the hidden fields or hack fields, you should be able to see that here. Okay, so here hack fields uh, was toggled off, here hack fields was enabled. You can see exactly which um, start field orders we were parsing, which field attributes got modified. All right, so we do have extensive logging here that can substantiate your security assessment on, on a Kix application. Um, you can also use this uh, if you're during your peer review process, right? If your peer reviewer wants to um, review what another tester did, this would be a, a good place to do that. So the last tab here will demo. <laughs> yes, this, this is the last screen. Um, so we have a statistics tab that again, you can use as a quick um, reference to see what was tested during that engagement. 
Um, and you have some stats here regarding uh, the number of attacks that were performed and the server IP address you connected to um, and so on. And again, this can be used as an artifact to, to substantiate your assessment. So that was our demo. Um, we'll, now we'll cover some closing thoughts before we wrap up. All right. uh, so as he said, some closing thoughts. Uh, mitigations. Their IBM does have a 3270 IDS, but we wouldn't recommend using it for reasons that we're about to get into. Um, what we would recommend using is RACF or some other authentication and authorization system. Uh, those systems do have the ability to protect the transactions at the individual transaction level. Uh, do not rely on hidden fields, so don't hide anything in hidden fields you don't want people to see. Um, these are all things that we have seen on real world engagements. And then secure your attention identifier keys. So don't have any hidden functionality, developer functionality, backdoors, whatever, in those keys thinking that people can't get to them. Uh, a quick word about the IDS. So there are two versions of the IDS. There's the BMS, Intrusion Detection Service, which is implemented at the Kix region level. Unfortunately, it can only detect attacks that were done through applications developed using BMS maps. And we have seen a number of Kix applications that were not. And in those cases, this is completely useless. Uh, the other one is the VTAM 3270 IDS, and this is set at the communication server level, so it affects every region on that server, but it is a massive resource hog, so much so that when we tested it and worked with them, they were like, this, we can't use this, it, it takes up too much resources. And on top of that, they both have the same flaw of false positives because they can't determine malicious traffic from just junk traffic, so they'll ab in frequently or send a lot of false, law, uh, false alerts, so it's just not really a good uh, IDS to use, and even IBM doesn't recommend using it in the documentation. Uh, the key takeaways we want you to have is that mainframe computing is not a dinosaur, it's alive and well, it's a critical piece of our modern infrastructure, and they're not necessarily as secure from exploits. Uh, there are ways to do attacks, and everything that we've showed you on here, we have done in real world Kix applications. Uh, there are now open source solutions for you to learn this stuff, and now an open source tool for you to do this testing on your own. Uh, we do want to give a special thanks to Soldier Fortran. Not only did he develop the DBCA application for us, he was kind of a mentor to us for a lot of this stuff. Um, so he has literally hours and hours of talks on YouTube. Just go search for him on YouTube and you can find so much information. Uh, this is our contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out to us for any questions that you may have. And there's a link again to the GitHub repo with the tool. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. It looks like we have like two or three minutes for questions if anyone has one. Two, two quick questions. Sure. Um, how big a deal is Linux in the mainframe world now? How, I'm sorry? How big a deal is Linux? I've seen IBM saying, hey, we run Linux, life is good. Yeah, they, they have USS, which is the Unix um, Inter, uh, interface and then they have Linux on Z and it is gaining prevalence. Um, I mean, we still see TSO a lot and that's still one of the main interfaces, but Linux on Z is definitely gaining ground. Is it emulated or does it run natively? It runs natively. It's, it's something you would install on the LPAR like you would uh, ZOS. And, and my second question is, uh, is Epsidic still like the, the, everything is Epsidic? Everything is Epsidic, yeah. So that was, uh, that was kind of our first clue when we were doing the Wireshark analysis and we were able to decode it using Epsidic and then that was kind of what led us down the rabbit hole. But everything over 3270 is Epsidic, yep. Lovely, thanks a lot, great Sure, talk. thank you. All right, well thank you very much. Thanks everyone.